Hi everyone, Teddy Baldassar here, and in this video, we are going to be returning to our series of reacting to some of your hottest takes when it comes to watches. I asked on different social media platforms, what are some of your hottest takes, and you guys delivered, so now I'm gonna deliver and reacting to them in this video. Also, if you've not heard yet, we are going to be doing a $5,000 wash shopping spree giveaway to a viewer of this channel. If you want to participate, head to the link below in the description to our website to fill out the form. On that form, submit the watches you would pick if you were the winner. What you'll do is you'll take links from our store and paste them into the open fields. The links must be watches from our site. Following your submission, you will receive an email to your email address that you'll need to verify. And each individual is only eligible for one entry. This giveaway is available for US participants only. And the winner is going to be announced in late February, 2023 publicly on our social channels and will be contacted via email from an at teddyballister.com email, as well as contacted by phone. Never respond to any unverified emails. We're never gonna ask you for your bank or credit card information if you are the winner for this. So please be wise out there. I see a lot of discussy characters in the comments sometimes saying that people are giveaway winners. Do not fall for that. I just wanna get out in front of that. You'll be contacted from a member of our team from a verified address. So head to the link down in the description below and best of luck to all that participate. Our first hot take states, most Rolex wearers compared to any other luxury brand aren't particularly interested in watches. So here's the thing with Rolex. They are a brand that has now expanded beyond our small niche world. So I would argue that this is probably true, but some of the most passionate and knowledgeable collectors that I know also are huge Rolex collectors. So it's not just you're getting only people that are disinterested in watches collecting Rolex, but given their popularity, they're also going to attract a lot of people that are buying them for different reasons. And when you extend outside the boundary of this small niche world that we're in, that's gonna be obvious. This happens all the time in different areas too. Like you'll see with like people wearing band t-shirts that can't name any song from a band, like wearing a Metallica shirt and probably wouldn't be able to name a song after Enter Sandman. I don't think this is necessarily bad, but when you're talking about, hey, would I go reach out to somebody that has a Rolex when I'm like, see it from across the room and anticipate them to have this really involved conversation about uh, the Chronergy escapement and what reference they have on their wrist? Probably not, but I don't want to also dismiss those people. There are, when you get to this level as a brand that Rolex is, going to be subcultures within the brand and why people ultimately collect. When you are a brand of Rolex's stature, you are going to obviously have people that are going to be attracted to them because of the status element element that they've done a very good job in associating with and almost being synonymous with success. That's something that I think you have to give Rolex kudos for, but I think for us as enthusiasts, people that really love watches and don't really care about the hype culture, that can also create different people getting into our world that maybe uh, when we're talking about from a purist standpoint, might not be ideal. So you're probably right, but that is also a factor of Rolex just being as large as they are and as successful as they are. The next hot take states, it's actually okay up to a point to be a watch snob. There's nothing wrong with having refined tastes, ignoring things that don't meet your personal standard and sticking to what you know and like. The problem only emerges when you try to enforce your own personal beliefs on others or judge them to be lesser than you based solely on what they wear. So I agree with this, at least the last portion of it, but we have to be honest about what the definition of a snob is and what is a snob looking up what the Oxford Dictionary states, quote, a person who believes that their tastes in a particular area are superior to those of other people. If that is the standard definition of what a snob is, which I agree with, it's really about putting down other people. I, I don't wanna play this game of semantics, but I don't think being a snob is okay if that is the definition. But your point about having different tastes and just because something isn't for you, that is okay regardless of what we're talking about. Not everything is going to appeal to me that's going to appeal to a lot of you and vice versa. There's a lot of things I like that I know people that watch this channel don't like at all. And then you also have to consider where people are at in their collecting journey. We're at all different points in our just love of watches and how this progresses is different for every single individual and where that ultimately ends as an end point is going to be different for every individual. If you go to the gym and start laughing at somebody that can't lift as much as you or run as fast as you can, I mean, that's not cool. And it's also not cool to make fun of somebody that maybe has a certain taste or maybe just can't afford certain things. Everyone has a different situation and I think we should respect that. So I don't agree with snobs. I think also gatekeeping is not good for anything. If you want a hobby and an interest to continue to become 
uh, something that's growing, you're not going to get there by deterring people and creating these hurdles so that they can't belong and feel like they can have interest in something unless they hit these prerequisites. That's not cool. I also don't think it's good to judge people when it comes to their own taste because that's all subjective. I really wanna talk about this next one because I've never really thought about it before. But this one states, even if someone gifted you a watch, it doesn't mean you have to keep it forever. So this is nuanced, and I will say there are some exceptions, but I would say I disagree with this mostly. Anybody that buys me a watch or gifts me a watch, regardless of the price, that's somebody that probably cares about me deeply and is a relationship that has a lot of substance to it. You know, gifts shouldn't be the way that you judge somebody for their appreciation for you or their friendship. But when somebody is finding something that you're interested in and is trying to put an effort in to gift you something, maybe it's not gonna be on your standard and most likely it won't be because we're freaks when it comes to being watch collectors. But if somebody's gonna put in that effort and give you something, I think that relationships means more than whatever you're going to get from selling that watch. I think in many of these situations, or at least in my world, we're talking about under $1,000 most people are going to spend if they ever gifted me a watch. And there's no relationship in my life that I would value, that I would be willing to sell that just to make any money at all, to just allow that to fund something else. Like it, to me, that doesn't mean as much as that relationship and somebody that put in that effort. I also think about who gives you this watch. If it's somebody that I'm not going to have with me forever, I mean, if grandma gifts me a watch and then I sell it just because it's not to my personal taste and then unfortunately grandma is no longer with us in the future, I am going to feel horrible. And I'm somebody that doesn't have any grandparents left. Some of my most cherished watches are watches that don't really have a lot of value to them, at least monetarily, but they have so much value in the sentimental concept just because of who gave me that watch or what the connection to that individual is. It allows me to feel a connection to people that are no longer with me. So not trying to take the vibe out of the room, but to me, this is a relationship question more than it is a watch question. The only exception I would make is if you are in really dire straits financially and your only way to keep things going is to sell that watch. Now, in that case, that's a really strange situation to be in, but that could be your reality. If that's the case, I think you have to do what you have to do to provide for your family and for yourself so that you can keep moving forward because these are expensive things. But if you're in a situation where you're not there and you are able to responsibly look after yourself, you have funds in order where you're gonna be able to live your life, I don't think relationships are worth selling a watch over. Scotty coming in hot with the next one. The spring drive is just quartz, people. It's not a true mechanical watch. You have all been hoodwinked. Okay, so this one is not just a hot take, it's just not truly accurate. This is just not true. You are right to say that it is not a true mechanical watch, but you're also not right in saying that it's just a quartz watch. Spring drive is a multifaceted movement. Uh, I will link to the video down below explaining it a bit more, but traditional quartz watches using electrical energy from a battery. That is the power source for that quartz oscillation. And there's quartz oscillation happening in a spring drive, but where that energy is coming from is mechanical, starting with a barrel similar to a mechanical watch, coming down a gear train, which then will alternate into something different. And how this energy transfer goes to power that quartz oscillator is a transition of mechanical energy to electrical energy. How that is done is through a glide wheel with a magnet at its axis and with its rotation eight times per second, which we'll get to more why it's eight times per second, when it rotates in proximity to copper wires is gonna send an electrical charge. This is also done at such efficiency that if you gave every single person in the United States and in Europe a spring drive, the amount of electrical charge there would not be able to power a 60 watt light bulb. Once it gets to this point, yes, you are getting quartz oscillation. So this is where this accuracy comes in. It does have an integrated circuit to send that signal to that quartz oscillation to ensure that it's going to the precise vibration frequency. But even further, we're also getting electromagnetic energy. So three forms of energy. And what that electromagnetic energy is going to do is act as a brake to that glide wheel. So one of the biggest challenges for all mechanical watches is friction. This is a frictionless movement in regulation. Traditional watches, an escapement, pounding back and forth with those pallets every single second, typically five to eight beats per second that you're gonna be seeing for mechanical watches. In this case, it's being done through an electromagnetic signal being sent to that glide wheel to rotate eight times per second to allow that second hand to move. So yes, it's not a mechanical watch. Yes, it's not a quartz watch. It's a combination of many different things. It uses three different sources of energy throughout its process and timekeeping to allow it to be what it is. It's its own thing. It's not a quartz watch. It's not a mechanical watch. And I'm not even getting into the details of how when you look at some of the premium ones, it's going to be more accurate than a quartz. 9RA2 
is going to outdo most run-of-the-mill course movements by a far, far degree. And then in addition, the finishing, I'm not even getting into that. Some of these movements are really nice to look at. So you're getting some artisanal finishing in the process, which is not usually associated with courts. So sorry to say this, Scotty, I disagree with this entirely, and I'd recommend maybe just looking into the spring drive a little bit further. For the next one, Craig states, I, for one, dislike non-sapphire crystals sold as retro vibe watches. The companies cheap out and try to convince us that this is how watches were meant to be. Really? Question mark. So I understand this side, but one thing I will say is that I don't think most brands are deciding to opt for a crystal that's not sapphire because of costs. Most sapphire crystals, at least if you're talking about a flat sapphire crystal, are not going to cost ex exponentially more than that of a plexiglass. So I don't think that's the reason. I think one thing that people just need to consider, and this is somebody that's dealt with a lot of different watches, is the different look that sapphire creates compared to plexiglass, mineral glass. Yes, I understand the upside of having scratch resistance when it comes to sapphire, but the look of a hard lex, a mineral glass versus a plexiglass versus a sapphire all create different looks. Sapphires, when done well, I think are the ideal scenario, but to do them well at times, sometimes it does sacrifice some of the look that you're getting. The reflections on Sapphire are usually a headache for many manufacturers at the low end. If you've ever photographed a watch or seen a watch in person, this doesn't always get picked up all the time, but sometimes you just notice there's a lot of reflection, glare, and things of this sort. Compared to that to a plexiglass or even a hard lex, the ability to just view the dial is much better. So there are other factors at play beyond just the scratch resistance, which is I think what most enthusiasts care about, but there is an element of just when you see something in the window or see something in a display or in a video or a photo of a watch, hard lex and plexiglass without treatment are usually easier on the eyes. There's also other brands that just have philosophies about how they think about mineral versus sapphire, We're probably talking about Seiko here mostly, uh, because they have watches that are more affordable than some of their Hardlex crystal models that have sapphire. But I think a big reason for this though is that there are different benefits to a crystal beyond just their scratch resistance. Legibility, looks, attractiveness, that does matter to manufacturers. And I think there are some things that you can't perfectly replicate with a sapphire unless you get very creative with the coating, which typically also have a blue tint in most instances compared to the warmness of a plexiglass or even a hard lex or mineral that typically also give up a very non-reflective view. And one thing I also would mention with plexiglass, and I'm not trying to say because I do prefer sapphire when it can be the case, but I'm just having a conversation here because I think there are some more things involved than maybe what is usually stated. Poly watch is a thing and most scratches that you will get on a plexiglass crystal or an acrylic crystal can be buffed out. So here's an interesting one. This one states, it's okay to buy a vintage Franken movement watch. It's very difficult for the lay enthusiast to know right from wrong for a 70 year old watch. Most are in it for the nostalgia or just find it cool. Even without the right movement, you still get 95% of the joy of ownership as long as it's not a watch that's known because of its movement. Now, surprisingly, I don't fully disagree with this to some extent. Now, if you are buying this watch with the intention of maybe selling it at one point, you just have to be honest about what the situation is. But if you're just buying a watch for your own enjoyment, you don't really care that much about getting something in perfect condition, you're paying an appropriate amount, given this being the situation for that movement, or you just don't have options to find the parts available for an older watch. This is the reality for many watches nowadays where these parts are just no longer available for these movement components. If that's the case that we're talking about here, I can justify it. It just comes down to when you are selling this watch. You just wanna be honest. You wanna ensure that when you're buying it too, you're getting it for an honest price. We have enough funny business going on in this industry. We don't need more waves of people adding to the deception that can happen in this industry when it comes to the vintage market. Uh, Cause it is very, very hard to navigate at times. And it's, it's a world where the more I know, I recognize how much more there is to know and how you really sometimes may never know. So for me, I agree with this. If this is for your own personal collection, you will know what it is. Fair play, but if it is going to be something that you're gonna eventually sell, just understand the integrity of that and you know what is needed to be stated in order to move on from that watch. Next comment states, we need more watches with steel case backs and creative fun engravings, like the old Seamasters, specifically on the affordable end. I don't need to see mechanical movements without any decoration or a cool feature. So I don't disagree with this at all. And I look at some of the coolest case backs that I've seen lately, I think you mentioned Omega, uh, with their 75th anniversary, some of those case backs were really cool. I know some people wanna see the open case back in comparison. It's a very just 
conflicting idea for some. And then you also have like the Silver Snoopy and some different case backs from other brands. But most brands nowadays just opt for an exhibition case back. And I think the reason being is that being a mechanical watch has become so much of a selling point for these brands on those lower tiers, especially if you did not showcase it, consumers that are maybe just being confronted with this and are not in the know, like maybe you are watching and myself, this is something that they can't afford to not showcase because that is their differentiator in a market with so many different watches. So for them, even showing off a Miyota 8 series caliber is enough to make it different compared to the different course watches out there or the smart watches out there that they're ultimately competing against. That could even be said for one, two, three thousand dollar watches and just showcasing the movement. This has become a selling point for every brand in the industry and allowing them to differentiate and has allowed this whole industry to preserve itself. Another point that I will mention though too, which I've noticed is there's the cool engravings on the case back, but then sometimes there's like this middle ground where brands just do just the bare minimum, but it's too much where you can't even engrave the case back. What I've noticed is people have asked me, hey, what should I do for a watch to engrave to gift to somebody? Back in the day, that was just standard practice. Simple, clean case back. But now I think about it, very few brands nowadays even give you that open playing field to engrave on a case back nowadays, especially at the lower end of things. The only brands I can really think of that do this sometimes is Nomos, uh, as well as Rolex and Tudor. You have that open display to be doing some engravings. A lot of other brands, this is just not the case because of how many now have exhibition case backs or case backs with these different engraved uh, patterns and you know, logos and styles. So that has been a strange thing. When people ask, I, I really don't even know what to recommend because there are really not many that you can go for nowadays. But an interesting comment comment and uh, I don't necessarily disagree, but I think it's a little bit more nuanced than maybe some of us maybe want to believe. And for this final one, I don't even think this is a hot take. It just had so much engagement on it that I felt I have to include it in this video. Most people don't even know much about watches. To the outside world, a $200 watch looks just as nice as a $2,000 one. And I think this is ultimately true. This isn't even a hot take, but if you don't know about something and you're looking at prices, it's hard to justify anything. And this could be for anything that you're looking at in life. I'm sure if you looked at, you know, getting some addition done to your house or, you know, finishing up a bathroom, until you know what the baseline is and creating a general idea of what cost is associated with doing that work or buying a good, it's hard to even know the difference. Most people are not confronted with the scale of what watches are. So when they see a watch, they see a watch. They don't see all the scale of it and what even to look for. This is why I'm so adamant about just buying what you like because most people that you're going to confront and see in your day-to-day -day life are not going to care at all about what you have on your wrist. You might get a compliment here and there, uh, but chances are those are coming from people that know and those that actually know, it's pretty rare. If you're buying a watch to impress others, you will always be left disappointed. I'll leave with this. I was, I was shopping in a shopping center where I'm from in Cleveland at Crocker Park. It's like this large outdoor shopping complex. And this guy pulls up this Japanese tuner car. He has like this custom exhaust on his car. It's like really loud. He's like revving his engine. And I could see what he was doing. Like these girls were walking by and he's revving his engine, trying to get their attention. These girls don't pay any attention. They just keep walking by him. And then you see like out the corner of my eye, like these 10 year olds, this is a true story. I'm, I'm being serious. It was straight out of a comedy sketch. These 10 year olds just come up to him and they're like, wow. Yeah. And they just start asking, like looking with his roll down window, just asking about his car. So there's, what you think expectation versus reality. The truth is people don't care about your watches. If you're into this game, I would suggest you're into it just because you love it. It's a fascinating subject. It's something that you can have for the rest of your life and continue to aspire to get more of. It's a marathon, not a sprint, but be honest with yourself and be honest with what the world is when it comes to this subject matter. It is something that is a personal journey. It's not a journey of others and trying to get attention for. But all right, guys, those are my takes to some of your hot takes. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit the bell icon. If you want to see more of this, that's also a great indication. Also check out teddybaldasar.com full authorized dealer of over 30 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, and a full factory warranty for all the products that we offer and how we're able to fund all of our productions here is through selling watches on our site. So if you are in the market for a watch, which I know you can buy a watch in a lot of different places nowadays, it just allows us to keep doing what we're doing. We love what we do here. Guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I will see you all very soon.